We're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians this morning. If you want to go ahead and begin turning there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to begin looking at the 12th verse today. And uh, while you're turning, uh, let me go ahead and begin by going to the Lord in prayer this morning. And just ask that we would hear His voice today. And that He would speak through His word to us today. Let me pray. Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father, what an awesome privilege it is, Father, to be able to gather together, Father, in this place as the body of Christ. Father, to be able to open your word, to hear your word as it's proclaimed, Father, your word that you gave to us. Father, to show us, Father, who you are. To show us, Father, of your great love for us. Father, your word that points to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, Father, to minister, to serve among us, but ultimately who came to this earth, Father, to pay that ultimate sacrifice, to give his life, Father, to lay it down, on that cruel cross, that old rugged cross for us. And that while we were still in our sinful and wretched and lost state, Father, He died for us to pay that debt for our sin once for all. And Father, to give us that opportunity to be put back into that right relationship with You, our Creator, that relationship that was broken, Father, between us and between you, God Almighty, because of our sin. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, that there is no other way to come before the Father God, but through him, putting faith and trust in him as Lord and Savior. Believing in his death on the cross and believing, Father, that he did have victory over death and over the grave, Father. So, dear Lord, this morning, as we hear from you today, I pray, Father, that all the distractions that may be going on within our minds and our thoughts right now, all of the distractions that Satan may throw in our way this morning, Father, because certainly the last thing he wants us to hear is to hear from you and what you would have to say to us this morning. Do what I pray that we just focus all that we are in these next few moments upon you. As already, Father, we've lifted our hearts and our voices in praise to you. And dear Lord, that you would fill this place and fill our hearts with your presence and with your spirit. Father, may your spirit just move among us today. And for the heart that's here this morning, Father, in this place that, Father, has never for the first time chosen to surrender to you as the Lord and Savior. Dear Lord, I pray this morning that they especially would hear your word today, Father of your love, of your mercy, of your grace, of your redemption, Father, your way to salvation for them, Father, so that they too might have eternal life forever, Father, living in your presence. Do Lord, speak to us now. Father, use your messenger this morning to bring the message. Not his message, Father, but your message. And Father, in all things, Father, it's you alone who certainly are worthy of our honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to start off this morning by saying that today could be a turning point for this church. Now that hopefully I've sort of gotten your attention. I'll sort of explain what I mean by that a little bit later in this message. 
But of course, as this church, and of course, Laura and I have been part of this church now, I believe, for some 25, 26 years. Many of you have been part of this church for way longer than that. But certainly over this church's history, this church's time, even from the very beginning of its existence, this church has faced many challenges. And I know many of you today could probably speak to many of those challenges that this church has faced over the years. But one of the main challenges that our church has faced, and let me say this, that our church this morning is no different than many other churches out there. But one of the main challenges that our church has faced is the challenge of being a united body. Unity. Being one together. And of course, now I could give many reasons as to why this is. But I'm going to tell you the main reason as to why it is and why any church would face this challenge of being a united body. The main reason is Satan himself. Because it is nothing but just simply Satan's attempt to try to destroy. We are told in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 that our struggle in this life... Our struggle as individuals, even our struggle as a church body, or any church body, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, folks, our fight... It's not to be against each other or with each other. Our fight is not to be with those that we may work with on a daily basis. Our fight is certainly not to be within our families. Our fight in this life is against the evil, dark forces in this world, against the devil, against Satan himself. He is the enemy. But if you look at this passage, 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, beginning in the 12th verse, look at how it describes the church here this morning. And our next article of faith, as we go through this Baptist faith and message, specifically talks about the church. What is it, Southern Baptist, and based on God's word, what is it we believe about the church? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, no matter the ethnicity there, whether slave or free, no matter what the social status is there, we were all given one Spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, just cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, then every part rejoices with it. 
Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You see, this passage, and I hope you picked up on that this morning, and many of you I know have, is this passage uses that analogy between the human body to describe what the church is to be. To describe the body of Christ. And as it said here in this passage this morning, that if the body, and this certainly includes the church, if the body of the church is functioning correctly and effectively, then all parts have to work together. Let me read you this morning what it says in the Baptist Faith and Message about the church. <laughs> Specifically, it says here the New Testament church of Jesus Christ. It says the New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and the fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, the rights, and the privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. Each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ through democratic processes. And in such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to Christ as Lord. So this morning as we read that, and as we've heard from God's word this morning, I want to remind us today, first of all, what is the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ? I want us to also look at real quickly this morning, what does a biblical New Testament church actually look like? And then finally, I want to wrap up this morning, what is or what should be the ministry of the church? Why does the church actually exist? Well, first of all, this morning, the purpose of the church. The first thing that we have to know, the most important thing to know, is that the church is the body of Christ. This passing today, as I said earlier, it uses that analogy of the physical, the human body, to describe the body of Christ. But in the body of Christ, in the church, Christ is the head. That's what we've read this morning. If you think about the human body, the head controls all of its functions, all of its activities, all of its abilities, because in the head of the human body, that's where the brain exists. If we didn't have a brain, we'd be nothing. It's the same for the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. We can even say Jesus is the brains of his body, the body of Christ. We are not the brains of the body of Christ, of the church. You know, in the ministry of the church, all of us, as the body, as the many parts of one body, all of us need to first and foremost look to the head for guidance and for direction and for the abilities to fulfill the ministry that God has called us as a local body of believers, as the body of Christ. Just like the human body without the head is dead, so the body of Christ or the church is dead without Christ as the head. Because the brains are gone. We're nothing more, if Christ is not the head, we're nothing more than just another social organization or just another civic club or just another country club. So what is the purpose of the church? It is just simply this, to carry out the work and the ministry of Christ here on this earth. <coughs> And many times we as the church, we try to make that purpose more than it really is. I mean, we talk about we want to be a light in the community. We want to make the community a better place. Churches will talk about, you know, wanting to right social injustices in the community. We want to serve the needy. We want to be a refuge for those who are facing difficult times. And, and yes, that is true, but that is not the main purpose for the church. Just as when Christ was here on this earth ministering and serving, His ultimate purpose was doing the will of His heavenly Father and being obedient to Him. 
hill. His purpose was advancing his father's kingdom through the proclamation and the teaching of God's commands. And so today, I want us to be reminded that our purpose as a church, this church, this local body of believers, is to carry out the ministry of Christ here in this community and around the world. It's to seek the will of God. It's to follow His headship, His lordship, His leadership in all that we do. And if we're not a body of believers that spend the time in prayer seeking God's will, if we're not a body of believers that spend the time learning from God's word and studying God's word, then how can we know what God's will is? But the purpose of this church is for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Growing the kingdom of God. Reaching those who are lost and who are dying. Through the proclamation and the teaching of God's word and through the gospel of Jesus Christ. See folks, as a church, as the body of Christ, we're to be evangelistic. Which just simply means telling the good news, telling the gospel. We're to be mission minded, mission focused. So what does a biblical New Testament church look like? I'm going to go with the negative here. I'm going to tell you what it's not. First of all, a biblical New Testament church is just not, it's not a place where people will just gather for a few times during the week. The biblical New Testament church is not a place where people come and just go through some motions of some ritualistic practices. The New Testament biblical church is not a place where people just show up and they fulfill their church obligations and their church responsibilities. The New Testament biblical church is not a place where people just come for another social gathering just to see and just to visit with their friends. As a matter of fact, you look at Scripture and you look at the book of Acts and the early Christian church, you'll see that the biblical New Testament church is not even a place. It's the people. You remember the song we used to sing as children? I don't remember how it goes. All I remember is open the door and there's all the people. Something about steeples in there somewhere. <laughs> but the church is not even a place. A biblical New Testament church is the passage that we just read a moment ago. It is one body. It is the body of Christ that is made up of many different parts. And Jesus Christ is the head of that body. And in order for a body to function correctly, it has to be a unit. It has to work together. It has to be one. Look at what it says there in the 12th chapter in verse 13 here. It says, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks. It doesn't matter what race or what ethnicity you belong to. If you are a follower and a believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of the body of Christ. Whether it's this local body of Christ and you attend here and you come here and you're a member here. Or whether it's a body of Christ universal all around the world. Of all saints, of all believers. It doesn't matter if you're slave or free. It doesn't matter what your social status is. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank or how little money you have in the bank. If you are a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, we've all been baptized into one spirit, into one body. And it says here in the end of that verse, we were all given one spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, to drink, to fellowship with. That spirit as we put our faith and trust in Christ who lives and dwells within us and works in our lives every single day to make us more Christ-like. And I want you to know this this morning too. That yes, we're one body and we're made up of different parts, many parts. But each member of the body of Christ, the church, is an equal part, may have different uses, may have different roles, may have different functions. But there is no part, there is no member that is greater or lesser than any other part within the body. Look at what it says in the last part of verse 24 there in our passage this morning. It says, God has combined the members of the body and 
have given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Why is this? So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Now, you know, certainly, I may be pastor of this church. And maybe my role and my function in the church may be more important than some of the other roles and functions that parts of the church perform or undertake. But even as pastor of this church, I am no greater or no lesser or no better a part than any of you parts are in this church. My 11-year-old grandson, who I was fortunate enough to baptize just a few months ago, he is no greater or lesser a part of this church than any person who's been a part of this church for 60, 70, or even 80 years. We are all one body. Several weeks ago, I want to kind of share a word of testimony with you. I'm going to try not to get choked up. But John Brady, our student family minister, sent me a text one night and he said, you got some time. I want to come meet with you tomorrow. I said, sure. So John came by and we met in my office. And John just opened up his heart to me. He just shared with me how the Lord had really been speaking with him and dealing with him on really just simply some sin in his life. His attitude. Attitude in many ways toward the church. Some things that were going on in this church. But really, attitude, and, and Mark knows this, and I'm going to confess to you right now before, that as John and I sat there and talked, the Lord just plainly and clearly showed me, as he'd already showed John, that really our attitude towards another staff member in our church had not been God-honoring, had not been god glorified. And John and I sat there, I don't know, we talked maybe two hours, and literally tears rolled down our faces. Because the Lord had gotten a hold of us. The Lord had broken us. And many times, you know, we've talked about unity in this church. And I've even said to our deacons before, I read a book a while back, where the author said this, as the leadership goes, so goes the church. But my focus as your pastor, as far as the leadership, was on me and the deacons. But biblically, John, Mark, and myself, we are the elders, the overseers of this church. We too are the leaders of this church. And we realized, the Lord just showed me, and I have been in prayer, praying for months. Lord, things are just not right. Where, where are we going wrong? What's happening? And as John was speaking to me, and I told John, I said, as you're sitting here speaking to me, I realize God's answering my prayers through you right now. And so as John and I sat there, I said, John, where do we go from here? He said, we need to get with Mark. And we did. I called Mark, and the three of us sat together. And we had a time of confession. We had a time of forgiveness. But we committed to each other from that day forward, we are going to work as a unit, as one unit, as a team together. I mean, we were all doing our different roles and our different functions. John with student families, Mark with music, myself doing an pastor. But we were all just going our own merry separate way. We were not coordinating and working together. And I realized for the first time, the Lord showing me, as I've made that statement many times, as the leadership goes, so goes the church. Where we were failing was in our ministerial staff. We were not working together as a unit. So today, first and foremost, I want to commit to you, the church, John, Mark, and myself, that you're going to see a difference in your ministerial staff. You're going to see us more working together and cooperating together. Working together as a unit. And certainly that is our hope and our prayer for all of us as a church. So a biblical New Testament church is a united people who have fallen prostrate at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ and surrendered their hearts and their lives to Him 
and believe in Him as their personal Lord and Savior, serving and ministering to each other and to the community. That's what a biblical New Testament church is. And this body, this church, we are a people in this local community who are to do that very thing. Nothing more and nothing less. Jesus tells us in John 15, and many times as we've heard this passage, we've sort of just related it to us ourselves being believers in Christ. But he tells us this, and I certainly believe it applies to the church. Jesus said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, then he will bear much fruit. That certainly applies to us individually. But it also applies to us as the body of the Christ. There is not one person in here who is the vine. We're all branches. We're all equal parts. And we're all connected to the vine. We need to be connected to the vine. And if God is going to bless this church, and if God is going to use the potential of this church to reach a lost and dying world, then us as branches, we need to make, remain plugged in and grafted into that main vine, which is Jesus Christ. So for this church body to function correctly and effectively, it has to be united as one with many parts that all work together with each other, not working against each other. And here's the last thing. The ministry of the church. It's really kind of a combination of the first two points I made this morning. The purpose and what makes the church biblical. Four essential absolute requirements that the ministry that the church should be focused on in its ministry. The first thing is this, preaching the Word of God. <coughs> Any church that's proclaiming anything other than God's Word is violating the purpose of a true biblical New Testament church. It's all about this right here. Again, it's not about the Baptist faith and message, even though that was based on this. But ultimately, it's all about this, and it's about preaching and proclaiming this. The second part, vital to the ministry of the church, is administering the ordinances of the church. The two ordinances, which is baptism. That's a person's first witness. If they put their faith and trust in Christ, that's their first witness of Christ doing a transforming, a changing work in their life. And that person being joined to the vine, joined to the body of Christ, not only the universal church body of Christ, but also the local body of Christ as well. So baptism is the first and the Lord's Supper is the second. You know another word, interestingly, we use for the Lord's Supper? Communion. What does that infer? Communion. 